Welcome, everybody. Hello, my name is Tamar Friedman. On behalf of Jewish Funders Network, I'm happy to welcome you to today's program hosted by the National Affinity Group on Jewish Poverty, Lessons from the Front Lines, a conversation with the VOTA's Service Corps Fellows. This webinar is part of a series hosted by the National Affinity Group on Jewish Poverty. This affinity group is in a collaborative of funders, Jewish federations, direct service providers, researchers, media outlets, and advocates dedicated to fighting poverty in the American Jewish community. During all of these briefings, we have been discussing the many challenges that corona, the coronavirus pandemic has created for Jews facing poverty and the agencies that serve them. And we're excited to be able to hear um, our presenters today and their perspectives on this issue. I will now hand it over to our moderator for this conversation, Susan Ditkoff, the Bridge Span Group Boston, who will frame the conversation and introduce today's speakers. Thank you so much, Susan. Good, thank you, Tamar, for, for kicking us off. Hello, everyone. It is good to see you on this summer day. Um, this is our last uh, webinar of the season. Um, we'll take a break until the fall after this. Um, so I think this is a really, really good one to to pause on and really think about um, over the course of these webinars, we've talked a lot about different camera angles into poverty in the Jewish community and who has been disproportionately affected by poverty. We've talked about vulnerable populations. We've talked about seniors. We've talked about people who are living with disabilities. Uh, we've talked about um, Jews of color. We've talked about all kinds of different subgroups within our community who are important to um, make sure get um, the uh, the um, the attention and the um, understand the differentiation um, about how different groups within our community are experiencing poverty. Um, so today, what we're very excited about is looking at it from the service angle. Um, and each of the people on this call has again, different camera angles into what service means, what it looks like. Um, and although each of them is from the Avodah program and there are other types of service programs out there, this is not about um, Avodah specifically, although we will, we will hear about it. Um, really the idea is to respond to um, members of the audience and members of the community who are interested in hearing what does this look like on the ground um, for, for young adults who are volunteering in the community, who are um, taking on service roles, paid service roles within the community. Um, what might they have thought going in? How have those ideas changed over time? Um, and just sort of really getting that flavor because I think that um, while this does affect many different groups in many different ways, um, hearing more and more voices from different generations, from different, again, camera angles um, is important to um, really understanding what we're, what we're grappling with um, um, as, as fully as possible. Um, it's not a univocal community or a univocal issue. Um, so delighted that we have um, our, all all of four of you here today. Um, Jennifer, if we can start with you, that would be great. And then we will turn over to Abby and Emma and Allie. Um, Jennifer, we have, we're, we're, I'm so excited to meet you, first of all, uh, that you have such deep experience um, in former parts of your career before coming to Avoda. Um, for folks who don't know, um, Jennifer has experience with um, AmeriCorps VISTA, um, with uh, civic engagement um, at the university level, um, at the University of Bridgeport, um, and student activities at SUNY New Paltz, and so just a variety of different ways to think about um, service to think about um, young adults in service um, and and what that what that means what it can look like and and why it's important. Um, so first of all, Jennifer, welcome. Thank you, and we would love to have you kick us off with um, any opening remarks that you have, and then um, we'll turn to we'll turn to our members. Great, thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for having us. Um, so um, I'm Jennifer Turner. I am the Avodah Program Director here in New York City for our Jewish Service Corps. Um, again, thank you so much for having me and three of our amazing core members here to speak with you all today. Um, our Service Corps is a year-long residential program for uh, young people ages 21 to 26 who've come from all across the country and from a range of backgrounds to form a 
pluralistic community that is really focused on Jewish values of justice. Um, we have a, a three prong approach. Um, we combine full time job placements at local nonprofits working to alleviate poverty and address systemic injustice with communal living and learning about Judaism and justice and how those all intersect. Um, we're really laying the foundation for a lifelong commitment to Judaism and working for a better world. Um, one of the great things is that our alumni really remain deeply involved in all kinds of Jewish communities and play all kinds of professional and lay leadership roles um, throughout their life. Um, in fact, um, Lonnie Santo, who is one of our first Service Corps cohort members, is now the director at Footsteps, which is also one of our current placements that you'll be hearing about today. Um, and this is really not unusual. Um, our core members and our alumni, um, they work side by side at our nonprofit partners. And for leaders in Avodah's network that and don't want to have a long term impact on organizations throughout our community. Um, needless to say, this past year um, has been very interesting with the pandemic, but we continue to run our residential program and the impact on the nonprofits was especially significant given the way that resources were stretched even further. Um, we were really fortunate this last year that the Weinberg Foundation awarded Avodah a two-year grant to support four members um, in their placements, which work specifically with Jews experiencing poverty. Um, these placements have included Footsteps, Met Council, DeRote, Project Or, and JCCA here in New York City. And then we also have a placement at the ARC in Chicago. Um, the core members that you are going to have a, a wonderful chance to meet today are three of the eight who have been spending the year um, really working with those most impacted by economic injustice in this country. Um, they have learned from and with their clients and through Avodah programming about the causes and effects of poverty in the US and the specific ways that poverty like really plays out in a variety of facets in the Jewish community. Um, it's really been a pleasure for me to watch the growth of these core members at these placements and the ways that they have been able to uh, not just learn and grow with themselves, but also to impact the rest of their cohort when it comes to deepening their understanding of poverty and how it impacts the Jewish community. And I know that working with Jews who have felt othered within their own community um, has also deeply resonated with some of the core members. Um, one of the things that I've seen as we interview um, potential core members for next year's cohorts is that these placements are particularly popular and they're overwhelmingly popular with the applicants for our first ever Jews of Color Bite, which will be part of next year's New York cohort. Um, growing our partnerships with these agencies serving Jews in poverty, poverty also helps to um, helps Avodah to expand our understanding of these issues and how we run our programs. Um, for example, we have an economic access fund for our core members um, because we recognize that um, finances can be a barrier um, for perspective, um, perspective participants. And now not everybody comes to Avodah with a financial safety net. And as we continue to deepen our core members and their own awareness of these issues, we have grown the access, the access fund and have increased the mental health support that we provide to our core members. Um, I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions, but I also want to leave some time so that way you can hear from our amazing core members today who are actually out there on the ground in and out every day and have so much to share with us today. Thank you. Great, fantastic. So, you know, I would love to hear from each of you. Um, you might have some <clears throat> opening remarks you wanna make, but I'd love to just even start out with asking why you decided to do Avodah of all the different things you could have done with this year um, of your life. What were your hopes, expectations coming in? What were some of the other things you considered and why, why was this one important to you? So Emma, you seem to be nodding the most intently. So um, would you mind starting us off? 
Of course, absolutely. Uh, um, hi, I'm Emma. I'm actually in the warehouse that I work in. This is like the small office in the corner of the warehouse. So sound might be out of control. If some, like, out of, it's out of my control if a loud sound comes up, but hopefully everyone can hear me. Um, and yeah, I'm really excited to be here. Thank you so much for asking and for taking some time out of your day to listen. Um, to share our experiences. I've had an amazing year with Abota. Um, and I am here, I, I think a large reason why I'm here right now is because before the pandemic hit, I was working um, as a costumer in theater. I was actually on a cruise ship when the pandemic happened. Um, both my mom and I were working in the arts and lost our jobs. And I just, uh, I, we were really lucky and really fortunate to have enough of a safety net to fall back on when basically we didn't have work for six months. And I just felt a real pull, especially as the arts were not making a comeback as quickly that I really wanted to help other people who would also experience the same instability this year. Um, that for me was really like, was hard and sad, but was not, I didn't completely ruin my life in the way that I know that it really impacted people a lot more greatly. Um, so I think that is part of why I reached out to Apoja and why I was excited to work um, in food justice this year in a food pantry. That's great. What are some of the things just as you were coming in, what were you expecting it to be like um, as you as you kind of decided to apply? Yeah, so I was expecting um, to have, I was really excited about building a Jewish community at home as well. I thought that the idea of like doing a year working at a food pantry in the pandemic was like kind of overwhelming. Like I knew it was going to be a hard year. Um, and a lot was going to be asked of me. There's a lot of people who are experiencing a lot of need. And but I thought that building the Jewish community at home was a really good way to um, like work together and kind of meet those challenges together. So I didn't feel like alone in it. And it definitely was that. I really have a great um, support system at home for Mama Oga. That's great. Great. Thank you. Abby or Ali, does anyone want, want to go next? I can go. Um, hi, I'm Abby, she, her pronouns. Um, and I'm from Maine. I don't know. Yeah, brief intro. Um, so I actually journeyed to Avoda. So I went to Dickinson College. It was where I really reconnected with my Jewish identity through um, a couple of things. Uh, mostly the Hill program there um, was a real like home base for me. Um, Cause like I'd grown up Jewish, but like distantly, I guess. Um, and so their like core values of the director there like have a lot to do with the intersection of Judaism and social justice and something just like absolutely clicked with that concept. So I was like, oh yes, this is why I like like associating with this faith, right? Um, so that was like, a really important journey for me and I knew that Judaism was something that I wanted to have as part of like my adult life in some way um, and I also knew that I wanted to do service and so I was graduating I was an international studies major I was thinking about doing Peace Corps I was thinking about maybe doing a Hillel Spring Board Fellowship with social justice but then again COVID became a thing um, and so a lot of things weren't hiring period like they were like no it's too risky we don't have space like nobody's going to be on campus for you know a higher education like you know student engagement jobs so like we don't need you as an entry-level person just graduating college um and so for that reason I was pretty late applying to Abu Dhabi I think it was like June 2020 that I like the application came across someone's desk um and I was really fortunate in that like there were these grants coming toward Abu Dhabi to do this high impact work and to kind of like, you know, help when we when people needed it most. Um, and I was like, oh, I need a job. People need help. This seems like a good intersection. Plus, it aligns with the values that I really discovered through my higher education. Um, and so I interviewed and I got placed with footsteps and I have learned so much more than I could have possibly expected. Um, a lot of my initial work in college had more to do with food security and international relations than it did 
with like wraparound services and like people at home, right? And like Abba does the domestic anti-poverty program. Um, but I learned so, so much about like, just, you know, everything that can be going on here and um, what it's like to build a community and a real home base, um, even with like in New York and like away from my own home. So yeah, I was very pleasant, like not surprised, but like exceeded expectations for sure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Good, good, good. So well, that's that's a great sort of segue to the next question. So Ali, maybe you should go first, and then we're going to get exactly to where you were going, Abby. Which is just what's your day to day experience been like? But Ali, do you just want to introduce yourself and let us know why you decided to do Avoda and what your hopes and expectations were coming in? Hi, yeah, I'm Ali. I'm very grateful to be here right now. Thank you. Um, I think my journey here was a little bit different. I um, knew of Avoda. I had a close friend in college who was a year above me do Avoda and in New York City. There are other, you know, locations, but she also did it in New York. And I went to her house once and I saw it and I was just so struck by the love they all had from each other and this space that they had created and that, um, that really stuck with me and I ended up um, working a job. I decided, you know, I'm gonna just kind of graduate though and like find a job and I just really wasn't feeling fulfilled. And um, I think I also, I wanted more community and I also was becoming more interested in exploring my Judaism. And this friend actually reached out to me knowing that I would be a really good fit and said, you know, there are some open, she, she was working with Avoda at this point, had finished, there are some open positions still, I really think you should consider applying rather than waiting until the next year. So mm -hmm. I, I applied and um, I was aware of one of the placements, which is where I'm at now, Project OR. I had heard really great things about it. And um, I knew I just wanted a really supportive work environment, but felt very unsure of my career path going in. I kind of, that was my priority was I wanted just like a really great work environment. And so I placed with Project OR. It was very, once again, last minute, I left my job and um, moved into Brooklyn to, um, to start this year. To that's begin great. the journey, yeah. No, that's great. That's great. This is a, a really great way to kick this off. Um, so why don't we just go back and maybe in reverse order. So Ali, so Project Or, tell us a little bit about that and tell us what your day-to-day -day experience has been. Yeah. So Project Or is basically like a community center which provides services for older adults who may not fit in as much or um, be as accommodated and provided for in other senior centers. So in order to place into Project OR, you do have to go through an intake process. And there are a number of factors that can make you eligible, such as a history of mental illness, um, history or current experience with um, homelessness, um, being Jewish and seeking Jewish community is another factor among others. Um, so we just provide a lot of support, case management and programming to our members. And um, during normal times, um, kosher meal, kosher lunch once a day, which I know is a very big part of the community aspect and the food access aspect of the work and were you asking me um, what I do day to day? Is that also? Yeah, yeah. How's your how's your day to day experience been? So I was hired as a volunteer manager, um, and that quickly shifted because I have been remote mo mostly, and there are not so much managing to be done of volunteers. Mm -hmm. So I ended up um, and continued to make wellness calls which is an effort that they that the staff members took on during the pandemic to check in 
with members, call them at their homes and see how they're doing and see if there's anything they need, any resources we can direct them to. Um, so that has been my day to day mostly. Um, I've taken on some other projects as well. Um, I'm working to record some members' life histories which are available online. Um, but day to day, I really spend my time connecting with members and really listening to them. Great. Yeah. Great. Abby, would you be willing to share a little bit about, about your role? I know that you are at um, Footsteps, which you just said, but tell us a little bit about what your day to day experience is like. Yeah. Um, I feel like in order to explain what I do, like, for those who don't know, Footsteps is an organization serving people who are leaving or looking to leave the ultra-Orthodox Jewish community. Um, it's like a very insular, like hyper-religious space. Um, and so, yeah, for a number of reasons, our members choose to leave that entire community behind. But the flip side of like being part of like a super insular, like community is that it's like your entire world, your entire support system, right? Um, and so are leaving all of that behind, they're emerging into a whole new world. Um, and so a lot of my coworkers like do a lot with wraparound services such as providing clinical health services or providing economic empowerment services to scholarships to schools or job hunting um, help. Um, but my job is as a community engagement associate. So I work entirely virtually this year to plan community building events, um, which has been a spicy experience, shall we say. Um, but a lot of what I do is meeting with members, seeing where they're at and what they want um, out of a virtual space from footsteps. Like how can we best connect with you with each other um and so what that's looked like has been you know a number of things from a book club that's been meeting monthly to a dungeons and dragons game that's also been meeting like bi-weekly um or you know member facilitated events uh one time we provided members with like paint by numbers and we're like let's hop on a zoom and paint by numbers together and it's been really heartwarming to just get to do like normal things with people and provide them with the time and the space and the materials to just kind of like be people in the midst of all the all the chaos. Um, and then the other element of my job is like our larger scale um, social gathering. So that can look like our Thanksgiving dinner. Um, so we call it giving thanks and we, you know, gave people gift cards to get themselves like meals with Grubhub and you know have a little meal to together and talk about like what they're grateful for this year or celebrating you like things that they've done that they've accomplished it's typically our graduation party that happens in the spring um and so we got to talk about not only like graduations but also personal victories like oh, I won this custody agreement with my ex who's still in the community so now I can still see my kids right like just all these things about seeing the individual where they're at um after they've left like such a restrictive space and like a space where they couldn't have celebrated those things with their peers um so that's you know that's my job pretty heartwarming stuff it it brings me much joy <laughs> great great so emma maybe we can go to you and then jennifer you might have observations on just how this year has been trying to manage the the program um i'm sure this is um, may or may not be what you signed up for um, when you first came on, but would love to just hear how it's been for you um, on a day to day. But but first, Emma, why don't we finish off with the, the core members? Tell us a little bit more um, about Met Council, what that's been like day to day. Great. Yeah, so Met Council uh, is a Jewish social services network here in New York City. I work on the food program, which is Met Council's largest department, uh, which provides emergency food. Um, to all five boroughs of New York. And right now, and for most of the year, I've been based out of our warehouse in Preston Court, uh, which is in NRC, Brooklyn. And I was, I'm a support member for both the office and for the people that manage the inventory, like Sasha, Stephen, and Ben. And then also have been a support person 
for the food pantry that's run at the side of the warehouse. It serves about 600 clients a month now. I think before I arrived or about a year ago, it served 300 clients a month. And also that council in general has almost tripled um, how much food we distribute each year um, in the past year and a half because of the pandemic. So the whole organization has changed drastically this year. This has been exciting to be a part of. Um, so I also was a part of the mobile food project, uh, which launched in the winter. Um, and so we have a mobile food truck that I was on and was manning and also helped like starting this new program, um, which can bring kosher food to neighborhoods that don't have kosher food pantries and don't have the availability for like a brick and mortar um, food pantry space, but have a need that we can address. Um, so that's what I do at my company. Great. Yeah, so Jennifer, tell us what it's been like for you to manage both, I mean, there are so many different aspects of this, both managing the program um, and managing the experience of the core members, but also the experience of the organizations that um, that the whole program is trying to, to help and the, and the people that those organizations are trying to help in a pandemic with all of the disparate impacts on different groups um, of people in the community. So just love to hear from your perspective how it went and, and what kinds of things sort of are, are on your mind as, as, as headlines from the year? Yeah, um, well, I think it goes without saying that this year um, has been been unprecedented, right? That's, that's the buzzword that everyone has been using for the last 15 months. Um, our, our core members had some very strict COVID protocols as we started the year and um, as you can imagine, in a communal living situation, um, that is a little bit more heightened. Um, so really, their only social outlet was each other. Um, they uh, most were working from home. We only had a few that were working in person. So as you can imagine, 10 people in a house together, nine people in an apartment together 24-7 um, is uh, an interesting experience to say the least. Um, but I will say the, the core members showed grace and resiliency and um, respect for one another and through a lot of trying circumstances. Um, we actually had um, um, a, a few of our core members test positive for COVID and then the, everybody had to quarantine and, and that was, you know, a situation. Um, but again, grace and resiliency by far. Um, they've also, we had a, a mid-year move that core members had to deal with. So it's, it's been a, it's been a, it's been, um, an eventful year, shall we say. Um, but one of the things that the, our core members have seen just through through their own experiences of living in this communal living, plus their service, is really how deeply impactful just everyday decisions that they had to make really were, you know, um, things like, is it, is it a, is traveling you know, as much as I want to see my parents and my family and that sort of thing, is traveling aligned with our justice values and those sort of things. And so, or ordering groceries or food delivery, all of those things became a communal discussion for our core members. Mm -hmm. um, and then as restrictions have lifted, um, you know, is it okay for someone to go to a basketball game? And all of these, these discussions that they've had to navigate as a community. And, um, you know, when we, when we are interviewing new core members, incoming core members, you know, we, we're having discussions about like taking out the recycling and, and those sort of things. And I'm sure many of the communal discussions that, that this group has had to have has never been expected. Like even things like navigating 
dating and and going out and being you know like those sort of things like is it okay for someone to go out on a date you know and all of those sort of things and having those sort of discussions with 10 other people um so yeah so i definitely um you know it has been an interesting experience to see <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine. I can imagine. And you've had so much experience, um, just to follow up on that, you've had so much experience working with, you know, young adults in service roles over time, just as you think about this, either this program or this year, just how has this been different from a kind of on, from the client facing angle? Um, I would just love to hear your thoughts about maybe what they got out of it this year that maybe other cohorts wouldn't have in prior years in your experience, or if, if they're if they're comparable, um, and or if there were things that you would still hope that they get going forward because they they weren't able to do it this year. I would just love to hear your, your comparative yeah. expertise. Yeah. Um I would, I would like to think that they have had um, probably more experience like with conflict resolution and um, negotiating and all of those sort of things that, that probably other, uh, other programs that don't necessarily have the residential aspect or even other service core years, even within Avodah that haven't had to deal with a global pandemic um, and just, it's a resiliency life skill um, that will continue to serve all of us really, right? Um, but especially these core members who've had the experience of living with nine to 10 strangers, you know, um, throughout the course of the year. Um, and I think also like just from a, a um, a service standpoint, it just goes to show the importance of how deeply important not only our work is or, or their work has been during the course of the year, but also how important community is, right? Like um, one of the things that for so many of us who have been home alone for the past you know, 15 months is just that that lack of community. And, and we can see like Allie talking about reaching out to her older adults or Abby and her work at Footsteps and just how important community or, you know, even Emma in the food pantry and her clients, like how important that sense of community is to our our well-being and our not only our mental health but our physical health as well. So, mm -hmm. um, I think that that is one thing that we have definitely seen is how how much strength there is just in having those human connections yep. and touch points. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. No, absolutely. And sort of as things are opening up, you know, just what is that real value of being? in person, what's the value of, um, and, and how do we build community? Um, we certainly heard on earlier webinars that, you know, there have been some times where people, again, people with disabilities or seniors actually got a lot more out of this experience because things were going online and they were not able necessarily to physically access a whole lot of things before um, and they that, that they have been able to access now. Um, and so there are some people for uh, just on that aspect are kind of hoping we don't go back to the way it was of only being in person because that too doesn't necessarily build build community and build connection. Um, a whole lot of things opened up. Um, and at the same time, so many things were were lost and sort of just reaching out and, and sort of figuring figuring that piece out, um, especially for people who, whose situations have sort of have been perhaps vulnerable before and were became even more vulnerable um, or disproportionately vulnerable throughout this time. So no, those are really, really good observations. Thank you. Um, so just on that line, well, first of all, I just want to open up the chat. If there are people who have questions, I did see one question in the chat um, about how each of you will take what you've learned to continue in your careers, whether you're inspired to stay in the nonprofit field, um, sort of how this has influenced your, your future trajectory. Um, so why don't, we, why don't we go with that? That's a great one to, to go with. Um, if there are other questions in the chat, folks should please um, type them in, but um, yeah, if we could do that, that would be great. How has this sort of influenced 
where you where you want to go next. And if there were other, if you had other ideas on where you wanted to go before this and what your ideas are now, that would be great to hear. I can go first. Um, I guess I feel really excited. I mentioned that I entered into this year and I was sort of like, I'll take any job I can get. You know, I just wanted the experience of being in Avoda. And I was hopeful that I would at least gain something from any job I was in. And I believe it did work out in a really, really great way, especially at Project Or. And for me, it's really solidified my conviction and the, the power of listening um, specifically and how related to healing that is. And I think that that has made me even more seriously consider becoming a therapist in the future, um, which is something I've always had in the back of my mind. But with this experience, it's shown that I think I have those skills and I just feel really fulfilled doing that. And it fits, I believe, into my greater vision of how to create a better world is, you know, I, I think that really that individual and interpersonal healing really needs to take place at the forefront. Um, and in addition to that, I'm also, I've really become more interested in exploring my Judaism. So I think I kind of, those are kind of the two things that I hope to pursue. And I do believe I will do that. I don't know how they'll, and I'm sure they will inform one another. Um, I think it's just a matter of what I prioritize next, but, um, yeah. Good. Thank you. Good. Abby or Emma? Yeah. Um, I can go if you can. There we go. Yeah, you can hear me. Um, similar to Ali, I came into this year like, whatever works, <laughs> like whatever gets me out of my parents' house, I'll do it. I'll do it like wholeheartedly. Um, and I think that what I found through this year of service and with Avoda and my experience with the nonprofit world um, and seeing my cohort mates in their different placements as well um, is like, I was left with this profound sense of like how much our communities or lack thereof uh, have a role in shaping how we handle our lives. Um, so, you know, footsteps and the footsteps community, people coming out of the ultra Orthodox community, my house, going through the move, going through and testing positive for like a couple of us testing positive for COVID and, you know, really relying on what community structures for like resiliency that we had managed to create at the beginning of the year, um, like had such a profound impact on me. And I was like, oh, I want to like, keep doing this like I want to keep helping people to like have the resources to do things so next year I know I'm going to be working for Tief New as an RA um there are programs similar to Avoda and that they like support new Jewish adults in pursuing social justice through service placements um but they're out in Portland Oregon and I'm going to be their RA for a year and then after that who knows maybe law maybe nonprofit management, we'll figure it out depending on how that year goes, like what aspect of it is like really what's pulling me. But I know it has something to do with like that theme, you know? That's great. That's fantastic. How about you, Emma? Yeah, I think one of the great parts about working for that council is just, I've just been to uh, food pantries kind of all over Brooklyn and as well as Queens and like basically seen such a large variety of neighborhoods uh, and communities that are in need of essential food. And so I'm like, I, for me in the next coming years, I'm excited to take, um, take with me like what I've learned from working in all these different pantries and basically be the kind of volunteer that I love when they come into the food pantry and they like are really hands-on and really excited to be there. Um, and so I'm looking forward to finding a food pantry nearby by next um, location and being a really excited volunteer for them. Great. 
Great. Um, there are a couple more questions that I noticed, uh, two more in the Q&A. Um, let's start with the second one. Um, it, it, it asks what um, you've learned about the systemic nature of poverty um, and how this might impact your thoughts, your activism, um, et cetera. And I think just sort of related to that, just any, any observations or things that you've learned that have just surprised or maybe deepened your understanding of poverty, both in the Jewish community or more broadly. Um, again, systemic observations would be great, but even just sometimes it's those individual moments um, that really change your, your perspective or, or surprise you or, um, or deepen your understanding. So I would love to hear from you three in particular, but Jennifer also like as you, as you hear the answers, if there are other things you've heard from other core members about like how this has changed people's perception, the core members' perceptions of, of poverty and what was important um, or what's going on, what the reality is. Um, that would be that'd be great to start with. I can go first again if you'd like. Um, so so this question was not about Jewish poverty in particular, is it it's about just to clarify, just about poverty. Either either way, oh. it could in the Jewish community, it could be more broadly, but how you think about it, either yeah. how you think about it differently, what surprised you yeah. or what was unexpected. I mean, I think, I guess to make a general statement, like anytime you have those direct interactions with someone, you know, the idea is that they're going to be more humanized to you and that your perspectives are going to change. And I do feel like for me, I speak with these members on the phone. I have met a handful of them um, at Pantry. I failed to mention that we actually do have a pantry two times a month that is supplied by Met Council where Emma works. So I've been able to meet members I speak with weekly on the phone um, there very briefly. Um, I think for me, it's, it's destigmatized it in a way. I mean, I'm just, I don't know what these people look like. I know a lot of them, you know, go to pantry, they need food, they don't have enough food, but to be able to actually form those deep relationships with them without the center of it being about, you know, them living in poverty has just like, I think shifted my perspective and um, made me feel more connected to them and people experiencing that while at the same time recognizing that that also is not my experience. Um, I also think another really big point that I want to mention is that, you know, society can be, uh, as many of you probably know, really difficult for those living in poverty. And in, with what I see, um, housing issues, um, I've worked with housing in the past, um, food insecurity and Project Or, I believe, does a really, really really good job of making sure that these members feel part of a community where they are not, where they're embraced for every identity they have. And we do not tolerate making these, the members feel um, othered as they often can feel in society. Um, and so I think it's just proven to me how much of a valuable resource, like having these even designated spaces where people can go as kind of like refuge sometimes um, to kind of like escape for a bit these like really deep pains sometimes, especially of isolation. That's a really an another big one that I've seen, which anyone can experience isolation, but um, I think it's all really connected. And so, um, looking at these in a really holistic way, I think has been very helpful for me. Um, yeah. yeah, that's that's great. And I'm sure that influences your 
career choices and activism that you were talking about a moment ago, um, the, that importance. We've talked a lot in, the, in this webinar series about centering the experiences of people who are most proximate to the issues and sort of people with lived experiences, um, what, what it means and what it looks like and feels like from their perspective. Um, so it sounds like you're really um, hitting on that theme as well. That was a really important piece of some of the earlier webinars. So. So thank you for elevating I, that. I do want to add something really quickly is I know I mentioned I, I do I have, I just think something that's really important is, as you just mentioned, the um, the lived experiences and in this like oral history, rec life history recording, like I think that that has been a really powerful way for people, even if we're not recording these to be put in the Library of Congress, which many of the recordings are like, having people speak about their life histories and their experiences like really I think gives them a big sense of power mm -hmm. um and so yeah I just wanted to add that to what you just said so good oh that's that's, that's terrific terrific good Abby or Emma yeah yeah I think I think one of the most surprising parts of my job this year or working with clients this year has been um, I think in the past I volunteered at soup kitchen style um, emergency food locations where you're giving people a hot meal. Um, but at the food pantry, we give dry goods and um, eggs and things that kind of need to be cooked and prepared. It's a pretty different clientele. Um, and a lot of the time, the clients that come to food pantries have careers and full time jobs and multiple jobs and have a place to live and have families or going by themselves um and so I, not, i've learned a lot of breath about a lot of different communities especially with the mobile truck um that food insecurity looks like a lot of different things that i wouldn't have necessarily thought about and also you can have a lot of pieces in your life that are stable and still be food insecure in new york city which makes sense but wasn't exactly what I was expecting coming into the year. Um, and yeah, I think I also, I knew this about that council before, but didn't understand fully until I was working here. But my first week of work was Rosh Hashanah of um, last year. And we were packing boxes in this makeshift warehouse that that council had to set up because of um, supply chain issues with getting food in the pandemic kosher food specifically. And so we were packing boxes that included honey and tea cookies and multiple soup mix and all of these like very specific Rosh Hashanah foods. And so another part of emergency food that I didn't think about as deeply is that it's not just about getting people food, it's about getting people food that has cultural meaning and that is specific to the needs of people that you're serving because those kinds of foods don't make sense in another community, but those boxes were going to um, survivors of the Holocaust who are seniors and mostly homebound in New York City. Um, yeah, and I really appreciate, and that's been like something that really fits well with my morals and is part of Met Council that I really appreciate that while we are in like serving people who are in need and are in crisis and an emergency, it's also about making sure that we're getting folks the food that they want and food that makes sense for their situation. And then I know spent a lot of time on that exact issue and talking to each agency and making sure that they're getting what they need. Beautiful, beautiful. No, and that's, I mean, the first observation that you made is very much echoed in the new um, research from the Pew study um, on the community, which was actually happened before uh, COVID, but still reported that how, how many people there were with that people would consider fairly, you know, affluent incomes, um, almost some six figures sometimes, um, who had still reported trouble making ends meet or paying bills. Um, and so just where that insecurity is, is, um, is not obvious. And so for sure, those, your, your observations on the, on the front lines are very much backed up by um, some of that data as well. So it's great to hear your, your firsthand perspective of that. Um, Abby, I don't know if you have any thoughts or if we can, we can also just keep going if you want. Yeah. 
I mean, I, yeah, I kind of just want to echo what Emma said is that like poverty shows up in different ways, like across the spectrum. Um, I think the biggest thing that I definitely have learned from my members is that like, that there's definitely a spectrum in like no one way in which their poverty or their need shows up is like worse than another. Um, I think what's specific to Footsteps members is like their religious trauma is like what is, you know, the unifying thread of all of our members and the way that that shows up in their livelihoods and their ability to search for work, to access food, to provide their children, like to find childcare, to get an education, to come to terms with their own identity, especially if they're a member of the LGBTQ community or, in, or a disabled community. Like that, there are so many different intersectional identities that can have such a profound effect on someone's life. And then when you add to that, the element of like coming into a whole new world, right? Like leaving an entire community behind, like leaving your social support structures behind, what does that look like? in like a Western capitalist world. And the answer is absolutely chaotic. Like it's absolutely terrifying. Um, so yeah, like there's just so much that people don't think about. Cause I feel like when we think about poverty or homelessness like we think about people on the street and that's just like not what it looks like for everybody. Um, so yeah, that's, yeah, that's my bit. <laughs> Good. Jennifer, is this sort of consistent with what you've heard from the other core members about just what has surprised them or what has been um, unexpected or from their person, you know, sort of what they've learned about the systemic nature of poverty, putting, connecting some of these dots together? Um, just curious what, what stories you've heard over the last year from, from core members. Yeah, I think it's ranged from everything from there are, there are Jewish people living in poverty, like, you know what I mean, from that initial response to, wow, there are food pantries that supply kosher food or, you know, those sort of things that, like, that people haven't even given any thought to at all, like, you know, or, or the, it, there's no realization that, oh, you know, like, that's even in the realm of possibility, which is very interesting. Um, but then I think what, what Abby said just is also how much like poverty and just affects other, other things affect poverty and poverty affects other things and how there's just this great intersection um, and, and how it really affects how, how people um, within the community both identified people living in poverty and how people living in poverty um, feel very marginalized within their own community often. So, and how does how does that work? And how do you how do you bring that that those that feel like they're on the fringe into the community and make sure that they're feeling as though they are part of the community and I think that's that's a heavy realization, and 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 for many core members um, who also have identities that feel on that fringe, like how how um, how is this a similar experience while also being a different experience as well? Yeah, no, that's so powerful, and I think that that's really. Um, it's, it's such a powerful observation. I can imagine sort of the experience of all living together and watching each other go through the experience of some of these realizations um, was, was very powerful as well. I can't believe we're actually almost at the top of the hour. This has flown by. Um, I think we actually hit a couple of the other questions in the Q&A about how you've um, sort of learned as a group um, and sort of working uh, to what you've gotten from living in a house with people working in other not-for-profits working on poverty. So I think we, I think you all covered that one, which is great. Um, 
and just the what you've learned about um, how this impacts your career choices, your activism. Um, so anyway, you've, I think you've hit most of the questions in the Q&A. Um, you know, I'm just curious, we have four minutes left and we really do try to end on time. Um, but if there's just one or two final observations that you would have about you know, as, as we think about this moment in time, right, we're here in the summer of 2021 and the world is opening up for a lot of people, but but not for everyone. Um, and a number of people are trying to move on to the next chapter of their lives. And yet we know that so many people are not able to do that either because of the deep trauma they've experienced um, through this process or just through the continuing vulnerability and the impact of the ripple impacts that it's had on their lives going forward. I'm just curious, are there are there things that are on your mind that you would just really want to make sure that the the community kind of takes away from this experience and, and how to kind of keep this this front and center um, as we go into the fall and into next year. Um, so these these lessons stay stay front and center. Um, sort of curious if you have any big picture thoughts about that. Um, or maybe when you talk to people who have not been part of this program with you, um, like what that what that looks like. Yeah, I would just say from that council and from the food program that the need has gone up exponentially because of COVID and it hasn't gone away. Um, that council has tripled how much food we distribute and the number just hasn't fallen since March of um, 2020 when the pandemic kicked off and so even if it seems like life is returning to normal and it is in a lot of ways the people that were most impacted by the pandemic are going to continue to fall behind um, in the economy because they were hit the hardest and had the least um, support network behind them so that the work is not over and that actually is exponentially increased and it's going to take a lot of effort and manpower to get everyone back on their feet. I guess I would say that, you know, my main focus has been in connection with people and that I would just encourage every like loneliness is an epidemic and it really is. And I know that my work has also been dealing with people with more um, with other manifestations of poverty, but I do think that loneliness is one that we don't talk enough about. And I would, you know, if, even if that means just like showing that extra compassion to someone you pass on the street or are interacting with, or you, if it means going further and there are plenty of organizations, I believe you can volunteer. I think with Sirovich, which is affiliated with Project Door and like make calls to people and check in like the way that this impacts people's lives is so I can't explain how large it is and so I just encourage you all to keep that in mind especially during you know such an isolating period for many of us um that this it's is not a come up. good good well thank you all so much this has been um, just so illuminating hearing your firsthand experiences. Um, Jennifer, from your perspective, managing all of this um, and just Abby and Emma and Allie from your perspectives, um, going through it with your, with your um, organizations um, in this fellowship. So thank you all for being here. Um, it's really, this is a terrific conversation. So tomorrow, let me give it back to you. Thank you so much, Susan. And thank you, Susan, for moderating another terrific conversation. And thank you. Jennifer and Abby and Emma and Ali for sharing your experience with us from the first minute to that last comment. There is so much to glean and so much to take in and to, to, to integrate into how we live our lives and how we might uh, our personal and our professional lives. So thank you so much. And, and I also want to wish you all luck in, in your next steps. And I hope that what you've learned in this last year and what you've given to the community helps you create even more, more goodness and more impact in the community, which we all need a lot, a lot of right now. So thank you all and thank you everybody for, for joining and we look forward to learning with you all again soon. Have a great afternoon, everybody.